Okay, so yeah, my name is uh, Russell Goldfarb Mirren, and as that introduction went through, I am the CTO and co-founder at a uh, startup in Denver called Rebound Technologies. And we've been working for about seven years to develop a new type of energy storage that uses uh, blast freezers, industrial freezers, and any kind of refrigeration system to deliver just ridiculously low energy storage to the grid while also delivering a lot of value to the customer. So um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging our amazing team that we have um, at Rebound. Uh, we're only six people and we do 60 people's worth of work. Um, none of us sleep, none of us eat. All we do is work at Rebound. So before we start, I want to just establish some, some caveats. Uh, this presentation is made for this wonderful audience, which is a mixture of very technical people, non-technical people. So I'm going to present everything in terms of what I hope will be easily approachable examples that we can all understand and believe in without shooting all the little holes in all the technical uh, details that you, that you might know of. Um, and then we can save that fun, uh, thorough discussion for questions. So um, as you will see, you know, the numbers all work out nice. Everything's like, it's a 24-hour period. It's a, um, and just you know, suspend your disbelief and then ask me all the tough questions you want later. Um, so I've also broken this down. Um, there are these breaks for questions throughout because there's kind of three main sections we're going to cover. So uh, let's just get started. Um, I'm going to start with an intro to what we call embedded energy storage. So here you have two, uh, two technologies, technology A and technology B. Um, I've given you both the cost uh, for the capacity and the cost for power. Both these systems are uh, grid-connected energy storage technologies. Does anybody want to guess which one you think is Ice Point, our technology? <laughs> well. It's actually neither because this whole presentation isn't about shamelessly plugging uh, Rebound and our systems. Um, the technologies are actually a common household water heater and a Tesla Powerwall 2. And um, what I want to highlight here is just how ridiculously cheaper a water heater is at storing energy for the grid than a battery. And as you've probably already guessed, the water heater is what we would call an embedded energy storage system. The Tesla Powerwall is what we would call a standalone energy storage system. And the distinction is that an embedded energy storage system is an energy storage system that does something else for a customer. So somebody is already paying for a service that that piece of technology is doing, and then it generates the ability to store energy on the grid kind of as a bonus. Whereas nobody buys a power wall to do some other service, except potentially brag to your friends about how you spent so much money on a power wall. But nobody is going to buy a, a battery to do something else. Whereas obviously, the thing that you're buying the hot water heater to do is to give you hot water. And that's what the total cost of the hot water heater actually is in terms of capacity and power. And so you see it actually is pretty close to the same cost per kilowatt hour. The difference is the, the incremental cost to turn a water heater into a grid storage device, which is a very cheap microprocessor controller and a mixing valve, is a very, very small incremental cost. And the customer is already going to pay this much regardless because they want hot water at their house. So that's just a really simple example of this concept of embedded energy storage. Embedded energy storage is a technology that is doing something valuable and coincidentally produces cheap energy storage. Standalone energy storage is energy storage that is purchased to be energy storage. So now, if nobody has any questions on that, we will embark on the shameless plugging part of the presentation. <laughs> Okay, so. Well, you could be using it to heat your house, hot water, if you wanted to. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. On the right hand side, you had dollars for kilowatt. Should yeah. that have been kilowatt hours? Uh, I'm giving both power and capacity here. So, like, uh, 
people love to break down cost in different ways. It's, it could be the, capa the capacity, so per kilowatt hour, like you're saying, and that would be the left-hand side. But also cost per power is important because if you can't get energy into and out of the storage very rapidly, then its value is diminished. So it's for storage, you want to look at cost per kilowatt hour, cost per kilowatt, and then if you really want to get crazy, you could look at like levelized cost of storage, which would be... But the Tesla will give, give, can give you cost either way. Yeah. So it's like, if you take the cost of a power wall and divide it by the maximum rate of charge and the maximum rate of discharge, that will give you the cost per kilowatt. Okay, so Ice Point. Ice Point is the technology that my company, Rebound Technologies, is developing. Um, it is the most flexible, most economically optimized refrigeration cycle that has ever been invented. Um, and the most important thing I want you to walk away from this slide with is that it is not a battery. It is a refrigeration cycle. It pumps heat from a low temperature to a high temperature. It coincidentally acts like a battery a lot. Um, right now, we have been working on this technology for almost seven years. We've deployed multiple different prototypes at different scales with different partners. Um, the biggest prototype that we have built to date is operating right now in California. We shipped it in February, commissioned it by April-ish. Um, so the, the, the fundamentals of the ice point system is what we call a freeze point suppression cycle. It's a new thermodynamic cycle that was developed specifically for ice point. And in order to understand it, I want to walk you guys through what right now we all use for refrigeration, which is the vapor compression cycle. So in a vapor compression cycle, <clears throat> you are moving heat from a low temperature, load is cooled, to a high temperature, heat rejected, by changing the state of a refrigerant. So in this case, the refrigerant could be any number of materials that are used in different applications. We tend to work at facilities that use anhydrous ammonia as their, as their refrigerant. And what you do is you change the pressure of that refrigerant so that it boils at a low temperature and condenses at a high temperature. So let's just walk through this diagram really quickly. As uh, starting as a high pressure liquid, so we're, we're at the, the uh, upper right hand corner, we expand that liquid. And what expansion means is just we're lowering the pressure. So you lower the pressure of that uh, refrigerant, and now its boiling point has gone down. And as you went through that expansion process, you actually boiled some of the refrigerant away, and that cooled the refrigerant. So it's a spontaneous process, happens automatically, there's no work being done, but the temperature goes down. Once you generate this mixture of liquid and vapor at a very low temperature, you can boil away the rest of the refrigerant and absorb heat. So load is cooled. And I have a terrible habit of using the word load to mean anything that could be freezing chicken, electricity is being consumed, the motor is getting too hot. So as I use load throughout this presentation, just bear with me. Um, we boil the, west, the rest of that ref refrigerant away and we end up with cold vapor. So now obviously cold vapor, we want to get back to that condensed liquid, and so we need to start doing some work in the system. <coughs> so we compress that vapor, and now we're going from low pressure vapor to high pressure vapor. That takes electrical work to do that compression, and we end up with hot vapor. Hot vapor then we can condense in a condenser at ambient temperatures and dump that heat to ambient. So now we've moved heat from a low temperature to a high temperature by changing the state of the refrigerant. Now I'm going to go, the next slide is going to be the freeze point suppression cycle and what you'll see is it maps very well to the vapor compression cycle. This is because fundamentally it's working on the same principles. There's a spontaneous process that lowers the temperature, we have a refrigerant, we're changing its state, and we're causing heat to be moved from a low temperature to a high temperature. However, the big difference is that we're no longer boiling and condensing. Instead, we're freezing and we're melting. But the fundamental thermodynamics is the same. So let's start with our refrigerant in solid form. Uh, it's really lucky that we get to use water as a refrigerant. Um, 
and we start with it as ice. Now, instead of expanding, because we're not changing the pressure, we're changing the chemical, chemical concentration, we don't expand, we mix. So we mix that ice with a freeze point suppressant, and that lowers its freezing point. Just like the expansion process, some of that ice spontaneously melts, cools down the rest of the ice, and we end up with ice in contact with freeze point suppressant at a very low temperature. And just like the expansion process, this is completely spontaneous, doesn't require any work, it happens automatically. We now have a bunch of ice at a very low temperature, and we can melt it at that low temperature. So we can cool a product by melting that ice. So we melt the ice, and we end up in this dilute mixture state. So now what we need to do is just like in the vapor compression cycle, we want to get back to solid ice. But you can't freeze this dilute mixture because its freezing point is too low. So what we do is we separate it, and that requires an electrical input. So again, we're doing electrical work to separate that mixture into concentrated brine, or freeze point suppressant, and pure water. The pure water, we now can freeze with just a conventional ice maker. And the concentrated brine, we can use immediately in the mixing process to produce more cold slurry. So just like a vapor compression cycle, we're just running around the cycle. Water is our refrigerant. And we use a salt brine, not table salt, a mixture of salts with a lower freezing point um, in order to drop that temperature. So while the thermodynamics are very similar, the, the important distinction is that all of our processes are inherently storable. So nothing that we're doing here is at an extreme pressure, nothing is at an extreme temperature, and we can take each of these states and put them in a giant plastic tank and wait as long as we want. So imagine if we made a bunch of ice, we could just put that ice in an insulated tank and wait a day before we mixed it with the brine and generated this cold slurry. Or even after we generate the cold slurry, we could put that in an insulated tank and wait a day before we cool the load. Once we cool the load, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you can understand how we can just store every part of our cycle. Whereas if we flip back to the vapor compression cycle, nobody is going to store cold vapor at negative 25F. Uh, nobody is going to store 40 bar liquid, especially if it's anhydrous ammonia. Um, so what we're doing is we're replacing the vapor compression cycle with a cycle that has inherent storability. Now, how do we actually do that in real life? Obviously, we don't just have four tanks that we you know, batch around. Um, our actual system consists of four main components. We have a giant tank where we allow a big agglomerated ice bed to form. And kind of like an upside down uh, push pop at the bottom of that tank, we're constantly eating away at the ice. So the ice is falling into a brine layer. We're constantly extracting brine from that, uh, from that brine layer, sending it out to cool a product, to freeze chicken, and then bringing it back um, and melting more ice. Then we send another stream to a boiler where we boil water out of the brine mixture. The steam that we generate goes to a compressor where it's compressed. And that heat is made available again to the brine to boil more water. And then we send the water to an ice maker. We have in the past used many off-the-shelf ice makers. Um, now we actually use our own proprietary ice maker. Um, but nothing crazy is happening in the ice maker. It's just freezing water into ice. Uh, the boiler and compressor setup is known as MVR, which stands for Mechanical Vapor Recompression. And that's also a pretty well-known, well-understood way of extracting water from a very high salinity uh, brine mixture. What we just covered was ice point, which I imagine has more questions around it than uh, water heaters. So does anybody have any questions, burning questions, on what ice point is before we move on to what the value is? So is the compressor, actually a compressor, is it working as a vacuum? <laughs> it's actually a compressor, yeah. So we run our boiler at ambient pressure, and then we run our condenser side at positive pressure. But you can run an MVR system under vacuum. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so you initially described it as an energy storage device. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see any mechanism for delivering <laughs> electricity. Does it, 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 does, it doesn't seem like it is right now? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's an amazing question. And I, I think by the end you'll be convinced. But right now, I would imagine nobody thinks of it like a battery. So we'll get to it, is my answer. Yeah. So what, I'm not an engineer, what percentage do you put in and get out compared to a normal battery, like of energy? That's, that's I'm going to answer your question. You're not going to like it. But um, we deliver, our round trip efficiency is something like 85%. But... Uh, because our system is more efficient than the system it's replacing, the net impact is like 130%. So imagine if you had a battery that also coincidentally you put it next to a refrigerator and it made that refrigerator 40% more efficient. And that's what we do. So our round trip efficiency is less than 100% because you can't have a round trip efficiency higher than 100%. But we're coincidentally saving energy by replacing inefficient refrigeration. So like, what is a Tesla Powerwall efficiency? Lithium ion is, like, well, I don't know. Some, I'm sure somebody here could uh, d debate this number, but let's say 70 to 80% or 80 to 85%. It, it could be similar. OK, so let's figure out how it's a battery. Uh, but first, we have to learn about chicken wings. OK, so. Our system integrates at um, facilities that are, that are called blast freezers. Um, and all those facilities are doing is they're taking food products and they're freezing them very rapidly in order to store them in freezers so that we can have chicken wings whenever we want, even though you know, we may not have the chicken throughput that day. Um, and so a lot of products are frozen. And, and I'll get into just how many of the things we eat are frozen. And the way that this works is down in that dark chasm is just row and row of, of racks that these pallets fit in. So each of these pallets is 1,600 pounds of chicken. And they fill this room with these pallets. Then at the top, there's uh, something like 15 horsepower of fans that are blowing air over those pallets at something around negative 30 C. So they're trying to freeze those pallets as quickly as possible. And the reason why they're trying to do that is because their whole business model is set up around getting product through the blast cells. So you can think about their, their, uh, their business in two stages. They blast things and then they store things. They make all their money storing things, but they can't store things that they haven't blasted. So the blast freezing, they get a little fee for blast freezing, and then they put those blasted pallets in their, their freezer, and then Chick-fil-A calls them and says, hey, we need you know, 100,000 chicken wings down in Kansas. Send it on over. And then a truck comes and gets it. And so they make all their money storing product. But if their blast cells aren't producing as much product as their freezer can store, then there's this imbalance. So they're always limited by how much chicken they can get through their blast cell. This facility, just as some, some numbers that are mind-blowing, they freeze 800,000 pounds of chicken every day. And their typical load for just the blast cells, not the freezer, not the lights, not anything else, just the blast cells, is 1.3 megawatts. Um, so this is a phenomenally huge facility. And it's also extremely typical. Yeah. So do like, companies like rent like Chick-fil-A or like rent out the state? Uh, like, do they own the chicken right there? Yeah, n no. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, nobody really, somebody knows who owns it. It all works out, and it's complicated. But yeah. Um, so what I, what I want to do is I want to actually walk through what happens to those pallets as they go through that blasting process to see, first of all, why a company would really want an ice point system, and then to show you how that allows ice point to be a very cheap battery. 
Here is a temperature profile of a typical pallet. So the um, temperature obviously starts out very warm. And then as you go through uh, the blasting process, it freezes. And after it's 100% frozen, it cools very quickly because nothing's freezing anymore. Um, this profile is problematic for vapor compression cycles because when you look at the duty, which is just the heat that's produced by the product, it also just follows this temperature profile. And the thing about vapor compression, like we were talking about before, is nothing is storable. So you, if you want to hit this peak heat transfer removal rate from the product, you have to size your equipment to be able to handle that peak. And then the rest of the blast cycle, your equipment is operating below its nameplate capacity, which is fine, but is not a very good utilization of capital to buy an $8 million refrigerator and run it at 20% of its capacity. So this curve is problematic. The way that they mitigate that is that they undersize their equipment. So this curve is actually capped here at their, the capacity of their equipment. The product could generate a lot more heat. You could get heat out of it a lot faster if you had the capacity to absorb that heat, but you don't because your equipment has an economic optimum that somebody said was the right optimum for the amount of product you want to blast. So you're limited. So what you could do with an ice point system because everything is storable is you can introduce a new heat transfer curve. So take your ice point system and discharge a phenomenal burst of extra capacity in the first five hours of the blast cell, remove all that extra heat that's available, it's just waiting to be taken out, remove it quickly, and what that does to your temperature profile is it speeds it up. So this case is a retrofit of an existing system, which we call a liquid subcooling application, which just means that it's a, it's a retrofit where we're putting in one of our systems and we're only doing a tiny amount of the actual load, but we're giving them these huge bursts of cooling. And what they get out of that is this 10% increase in, uh, in blast freezing capacity, which sounds very small and is very small, but is great for a startup as, a, as an initial market and is huge for them because, like I was saying before, the blast freezer is the gate to all of their revenue. So if they can get 10% more through the blast cell, that's 10% more blasting fees, but it's also 10% more storage revenue that they're ready to, to get at no cost. So it makes a lot of sense for them to use this technology to, to use these huge bursts of cooling in the first few hours of the blasting cycle to increase their blasting capacity by just a little bit. And so what that looks like from a payback standpoint is today, right now, their only solution is add more what we call legacy equipment, which is more compressors, more condensers, more vapor compression capacity. But that's not really in their economic best interest because yes, you could speed up your blast freezer a little bit, but mostly that equipment is going to sit idle. So instead, what they can do is add an ice point system that has almost the same installed cost per nameplate ton, but we can discharge all of our cooling in those key hours, and our system is never sitting idle. So our ice maker runs 24-7, our separator runs 24-7. So that's why we can drive down the payback from 5.7 to 1.7 years, because they're effectively buying four times less equipment from us than they would have to buy from, uh, from legacy equipment to get the same impact. Um, we haven't gotten to your question yet, uh, but it's the very next section, so, so don't worry. Yeah? So the other benefit is you're, you're offering them a system that is not going to need as much maintenance and repair and replacement as the compressor-based system, right? Uh, we think so. I, I, would, I would love you to write that down and we could give it to some people. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in, yeah, in theory... As much a selling point as anything because you're going to be replacing very expensive equipment far sooner than, this, than what you have. Yeah, I mean, in theory, our system is, you know, 
ambient pressure components. It's a lot of, it's still welded pipe, but it's, it's just a lot easier equipment to work on. Um, and, and that is something we talk about. Mostly people are like, great, let's see it in 10 years, which is fair. Yeah. Um, somehow I'm reminded of uh, gas peaker plants. Yeah. Would this be a, a, a good analogy to what you're doing there? Uh, yeah, it, it would in the sense that like a gas peaker plant normally, you know, can scale wildly up and wildly down. Um, the, the thing, the, the issue that I would take with that analogy is that imagine a gas peaker plant that you could, you could buy, you know, gas peaker plant runs four hours of the year. Uh, imagine if all of those other hours of the year, it was generating storing up to give you those peaks and the equipment that you buy has to be only as big as you know the, the capacity you're buying is only as big as the average not the peak and that's really the the thing we're playing with is you know averages versus peaks the legacy equipment has to be sized to the peak we are sized to the average um, which in these cases turns out to be you know a very stark difference Yep. In your graph of the power needed for the chicken, is there also a big flat spot for many hours when Forklift Joe needs to go and take the chicken out and put it in the other refrigerator? They have hordes of uh, computer scientists sitting in, in buildings trying to figure out how to optimize how Forklift Joe, as you say, should, should uh, move his forklift around. So if we went back to this, what would happen here is then there's four hours of the thing being unloaded and loaded, which is how long it takes them until the next blast starts. But that's time you can make ice. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of um, these kind of moments where, like, like at the, the facility where we have our pilot, the utilization of their equipment is 11%. That's how much they're running their equipment at full capacity throughout the year. And it's like in one of their buildings, which they have four buildings there, it's on the order of you know, tens of millions of dollars of equipment and it's running at 11%. Um, and so there's just phenomenal value in being able to run at 100% and deliver cooling like you are running at 100% um, via the storage. So that gets us to why do the customers want to pay for ice point, but it doesn't get us to how does ice point become a battery for the grid. And the answer uh, in, in almost all embedded grid storage systems, but not all, um, comes down to demand response, flexible grid, um, all of these kind of buzz buzzwords. But what we're doing here, we, I've switched the graph now. We, we're now looking at the graph of the ice point system, not their cooling demand, but what the ice point system is, is giving. Um, and so, you know, you see for the first five hours, we're giving 100 kilowatts, and then um, we drop to nothing, and, uh, you know, the electrical demand of our system is just chugging along because the whole time the ice maker's just making ice, the separator's just, made, just separating the brine, and it's either storing or discharging, but our electrical consumption is very flat. So now imagine in this case, if the utility said, we wanna turn your ice point system into a demand response asset. And when we have not enough solar on the grid, we're gonna turn your, uh, your ice point system off. Or when we have too much air conditioning load, we're going to turn your ice point system off. They could do that. And so let's say they turned off the system for six hours in the middle of the day. They can do that. And that doesn't affect the cooling we provide to the customer at all. So long as we oversize the system just enough to make up for this area in this little sliver of area. And so we're able to generate a very rapidly responding uh, demand response asset on the grid that acts just like a battery, performs the same services as a battery, but we're able to do it for an incremental cost because just like that water heater example, the customer has already paid for all of this cost. So here I have broken down the cost of our system loosely. 
uh, with everything levelized against kilowatt hours. So this is effectively the storage cost of the system. If you were going to buy an ice point system and run it just like a battery, not do any service for the customer and actually freezing product faster, it would cost you 400 and change dollars per kilowatt hour. But because the customer already wants this and is happy to, to buy it to help their bottom line, we don't have to charge that to the battery. All we have to say is, what is the incremental cost of adding six hours of storage to the grid? And the incremental cost is only $41 per kilowatt hour, which is insanely low. Um, and that really comes up with all of these embedded energy storage ideas, is that if you can find a way to take a service that a customer already wants, deliver it that to them, and coincidentally produce energy storage, that's always going to be cheaper than finding a customer and giving them a battery. Yeah? So go back to the previous graph. What you're saying, that if I understand it correctly, is that dip is when you are not using electrical power. Right, right. So that's your, it's a, it's a quasi form of storage. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like any any flexible grid type energy storage technology where dropping demand by 100 kilowatts is the same as putting 100 kilowatts back on the grid. So it's, it's, a, it's a quasi, that's why I'm saying we're using the term. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and another key point on this slide is that the dip there, I made it not overlap with cooling provided, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, we can provide cooling and not be consuming electricity at the same time. So I think the final question that people are likely to have is like, OK, $41 a kilowatt hour, that's pretty low. But this is a niche thing, blast freezers. I've never seen a blast freezer. Uh, and I think that's a totally fair point. So I wanted to address that. Um, it is shocking how much of the food we eat is frozen. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, Boulder, we're an outdoor crowd. Uh, Lara bars. The fig paste that's used in Lara bars is frozen just, uh, just north of Denver. Lara bars are non-perishable, non-refrigerated, but the components to them are frozen. Uh, or uh, craisins is the other example. Craisins, non-perishable, not refrigerated. They're actually frozen twice. They freeze them, then they thaw them to cut them, and then they freeze them again. So blast freezing is this behind the scenes industry that we absolutely depend on for our food quality and our food system. Uh, if we converted just cold storage facilities with blast freezers, we could generate enough storage capacity to give us 49 gigawatt hours worth of effective battery or quasi battery um, and a power of 16 gigawatts. If we then go a step further and we take all of the industrial and commercial refrigeration, so non blast freezing cold storage, supermarkets, walk in freezers, we can generate up to 281 gigawatt hours. And that's not enough energy storage to just be like, problem solved. But it is a, a phenomenally large amount. And what I really want everybody to leave here today thinking about is this is just one of the thermal processes that we as a society do and depend on. You can take any thermal process and do this to it. We chose refrigeration because we really wanted to work with ice. But there's really no reason that you can't take any thermal process that's happening in industry, even in residential, and make it into an embedded energy storage device. So I see this as a way to provide all of the energy storage that the grid needs. And I hope that people will, will go out. I've had a dream that people will go out and start another startup that does some other um, embedded energy storage device uh, with some other thermal process. Or even compete with us. That would be fine, too. Um, 
So at that, you know, I want to open it up to questions ranging from an anything as technical as you want, as non-technical as you want. Um, we'll start with that. Okay. Yeah, just real kind of basic question. It, it appears to me that the equipment that you're using is significantly larger in physical size than a what you're calling legacy equipment. Is that, is that a true statement? Yeah, well, especially because we have a giant tank of ice. Okay. Does that become an obstacle? Uh, really, for blast freezers, no. Um, these facilities are almost all located in very rural uh, places. So we've gone to a handful of facilities now, toured them, mapped out where equipment would go, and it's never an issue. Um, the system that we make is containerized and can go right outside. So as long as they have land, it's, it's not really a problem. Um, certainly, if you wanted to do something at a supermarket, you would need you know, uh, two parking spaces worth of ice to, to service a supermarket. So for some supermarkets, that's absolutely a deal breaker. Um, but I mean, it, it really all comes down to what's the economics of two parking spaces versus the, the amount they're paying in electricity. Got it. Yeah. yeah. But certainly, footprint is a, a hot button issue. Um, yeah. um, a, a week ago in this room, I met uh, Kit Seaborg, who is the communications director of Project Drawdown. And Project Drawdown has actually identified uh, climate solutions to draw down carbon. And uh, guess what? Refrigeration is sitting right on top of their rank listing. So I urge you all to go to drawdown.org and check out uh, that rank list. Yeah. Um, so you're right in line with providing the most important and effective solution to doing something about climate change. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, there's, there's also an amazing New York Times article and also, coincidentally, a blog post that <clears throat> I wrote a couple months before that New York Times article um, about how if you want to be a young person solving climate change, learn about refrigeration. Yeah. 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 Uh, how much water does your system use, and does it like reuse? Yeah, yeah. There is a lot of water, thousands of gallons of water in the system, but it's all closed loop. So we don't lose any water. Um, because if we did, it's really salty water and would be gross. Yeah. So one thing that I, I can understand how using it for blast furnaces makes a lot of sense because you have that big load, you're using storage you're, to build up and for the next cycle. In, a, in the case of a, a steady state load, pretty much, which is what you have in a supermarket, how would that work? Yeah. yeah, so in a supermarket, you're actually much more incentivized to do the electrical arbitrage. So the way we think about it is the system generates value doing thermal arbitrage or electrical arbitrage or combination. What do you mean by arbitrage? Yeah, so in both cases, what we mean is there is some hour of the day where it's very valuable to either be discharging a lot or be not consuming any electricity. So this would be using the storage for off, off peak. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Freezing so that you can then run those freezers with that same source. Yeah. yeah. So, so at a supermarket, the whole equation shifts. At a blast <laughs> freezer, all the value is thermal arbitrage. They need these giant peaks. At a supermarket, they have a very, very steady load, and it all turns to load shifting, where you're going in and you're saying you have these demand charges. And luckily, the, the economics of the, the tariffs that they're charged work out that way, where these cold storage facilities are paying like three cents, eight, eight cents a kilowatt hour at the most. And so there's not a lot of incentive. Yeah. So would the supermarket scenario be the same as for a hockey rink? I have I have never seen the data for a hockey rink thermal load. I would love to see that data. Um, my my guess is it's my guess is it's very constant. Um, but but it's all kind of a, a range. So let me give you an example: a cold storage facility without uh, blasting is right in the middle, 
where they have a load that changes a fair amount as loads as trucks come in and trucks go out. Um, but it's not this crazy change that you see in a, in a blast freezer. And there, the economics become really about using both the electrical arbitrage and the thermal arbitrage to decrease the initial capital cost. So what you want to do is you want to say, you know, we need a system that consumes power like this and makes a thermal profile like this, and it's going to cost less. So we see like non-blasting cold storage facilities as a great secondary market once we can take over more load, we don't need to be retrofitting, and customers are willing to take on more risk with, with their, or our product is de-risked, so they're willing to give us more load. Yeah. Uh, you said you dreamed about other companies doing this sort of thing. Well, there are some that maybe we're, um, like there's this company called Stepis that makes electric thermal storage. Yeah. 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 Storing heat in ceramic bricks as opposed to ice. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, those guys, yeah, are really cool. And it's, I, I feel like um, I could go on a rant for hours about hardware startups, but like it's very difficult to take a hardware idea, especially when it's a bit different than, say, a battery. I mean, we run into that a lot where it's very difficult to explain to investors how this is a battery and how we can solve climate change with it. Um, and and Stephis, this, I, I'm sure they run up against those same problems. So um, yeah, that, and they're kind of like where that whole hot water example, I mean, I didn't, think up the idea of hot water as embedded storage. And, the, it, and it's a similar market where it's like, it's a huge resource. Like if we could convert all electric water heaters, it would be phenomenally impactful. Yeah. Was that like your first idea when starting Rebound? Like let's make embedded storage or was it just creating like efficient refrigeration that like turned into that? Yeah, um, this could also be a very long answer. Uh, in short, what happened was I really, I wanted to do embedded storage um, and I wanted to use ice. Those were the two big things. And so for the first year of Rebound's life, I just modeled a, a system every day um, until I, through many steps, created freeze point suppression. Yeah. So would it work for HVAC? Is that too low grade? Of an yeah. yeah, no, um, we, when, when we're giving the really high, you know, let's all dream together uh, pitch to investors, um, we talk about the platform technology or the platform nature of the technology. So we have, I wouldn't call them designs, thought experiments for HVAC systems. Um, everything kind of changes. You change materials, you don't use water. Um, you use other materials in a freeze point suppression cycle, but the fundamental thermodynamics works great and there's no reason why you can't use it to pump heat from 60C or 60F um, instead of negative 25F. Yeah. Why, why did you guys select mixing salt, uh, mixing and separating salt and water as opposed to any other company? We just, we just loved the feeling of when you're just covered in salt water <laughs> at like, one in the morning. Um, no, so we actually have run a bunch of different um, freeze point suppressants. So we've run systems with salt water uh, using like potassium formate, potassium acetate, kind of like organic salts that are very low corrosivity. Um, we've also run systems with less um, friendly salts like calcium chloride. Um, and then we've also run systems with uh, volatiles like ethanol and methanol and really anything that lowers the freezing point, which is really anything that's soluble in water, you can make a freeze point suppression cycle out of. Um, it really changes more so based on what market you're going after and what technology you want to use to separate. So if you want to use waste heat to separate, you're kind of driven towards volatiles. And if you want to use power to separate, you're driven towards salts. And that's just an uh, efficiency, which I don't know if you have follow-up questions I can go into yeah yeah 
Abrigo is maybe the world's largest solar thermal company. Yeah. yeah. Did, it, did any of your work come out of that? Yeah, so I, <laughs> it came out of it in that I, uh, in the intro, Chris talked about, you know, I raised a bunch of money for a new kind of concentrated solar power system that would make a lot of the bottlenecks in a CSP plant um, a lot better by using a molten metal, which is not a new idea at all. Um, but the, the kind of the, I, the new aspect of it was that it would also be a phase change um, CSP plant. So it would be phase change molten metal. And it was really cool and we raised a bunch of money and got a bunch of partners to do it. And um, then after working on it for a few years, I realized that even though we had raised so much money, we would have to raise so, so, so much money to get it to work. Um, and it would take years and years and years and it just wasn't gonna happen in time to have an impact. And so um, really leaving Avangoa was a reaction to that industry where everything is focused on higher pressure, higher temperature, and, and not really looking at like, you know, there's a broader system here. And if we look at the broader system, maybe we can figure out how to do very valuable things, not with molten aluminum um, in a concentrated solar power receiver, which was a challenging problem. Um, and so that was really my, my, re my, where I would say I, I got something from Abengoa to start rebound was that I, it was a very good place to learn how expensive it is to incrementally improve something 20%. How, how does the word rebound fit in? Yeah, um, I was playing around with words um, one day and came up with the name. Um, what I wanted to do at the beginning was, instead of calling it embedded uh, energy storage, for a while I was calling it bound energy storage because it was like a system bound together. That didn't resonate with anyone, um, but I thought it was really cool. And, uh, and then RE was for renewable energy. So it was like renewable energy bound. It was gonna be this great like play on words and um, it lasted for like a solid month and then I never. And is there a possible RE side to this? Is there a possible what? RE aspect to this. Uh, you mean like for, for as, as far as renewable energy goes? Yeah, I mean, I, I've often thought um, that it would be really cool to do a much more direct integration. So like find a facility that has a lot of solar or has a lot of very local um, renewables and really tie, couple them together much more directly um, in kind of like, you know, you could say like a microgrid kind of situation where Rebound provides the balancing load for all of the renewables on the microgrid. Um, but, you know, I'm a technical dreamer, and right now it's just about making things that work for 10 years. Well, it'd be great for Boulder when it municipalizes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So is this similar to like the heat pump residential like, heating cooling systems that have come out like the same kind of thermocycle going on and could that be used as an energy battery or is that completely different? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I would say that it's, it's very much in the same vein, um, but not super related. Uh, <laughs> like related that, you know, all me and those guys, we could get together and talk about how hard it is to do thermodynamics. Um, but, you know, as far as like materials and exactly what we're doing, it's quite a bit different. Um, but yeah, but, I mean, they're all heat pumps. So they're all fundamentally, like when you get to the bottom of every heat pump, it's all just entropy driving it around, which I should say my uh, co-founder, Kevin, who's uh, amazing and, um, but he's always like, don't say entropy. Entropy turns people off. Don't. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Your process is making ice cubes, but to make the ice cubes, you need to do a vapor compression cycle to make the ice cubes together. Yeah. Yeah. Can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, sure. So um, the it, it's best to think about the system like um, a cat, what's called a cascaded refrigeration cycle. So 
Uh, in a lot of industrial settings, what they'll do is they'll have a top cycle that's very efficient at moving heat from, let's just use an example that's good for us, uh, 32F to ambient. There's one refrigerant, one set of compressors. Every, it's very optimized for that temperature lift. And then there's another refrigerant that's much better at pulling uh, heat out of a very cold evaporator, so negative 40F, negative 25F, and pumping that heat up to 32. So like an example of that would be like ammonia is very, very good at high temperatures. And once you get down low, it's OK, but CO2 is significantly better. So if you stack those up, you actually get a much better system than if you do the whole thing with ammonia. Um, you can think about our system the same way. We use R134A in our ice maker, or R517, which is the low global warming replacement for 134A, or we use ammonia. Anyway, we're kind of agnostic to the refrigerant, but we can use a refrigerant there that is very, very, very good at making ice and not super great at low temperatures, and really not great at delivering thermal arbitrage at those low temperatures. And so you really, our system is really a, just a cascaded system where we use one heat pump to make the ice and then another heat pump to deliver the valuable cooling. But we, yeah, we're very, at this point especially, very dependent on a vapor compression cycle. And, and I have no problem, I'm not like an anti-vapor compression cycle guy at all. There's just like good things about them and bad things. Yeah. So near the beginning of your slide deck, you talked about the embedded water heater. And so is it reasonable to think of that as essentially a heat sink? I'm sorry. If we have a system with overgeneration, then you, instead of turning off those turbines or solar panels, solar farm or whatever, you send it to distributed water heaters, which will then raise the temperature from whatever, 110, 120 Fahrenheit to like maybe 160 Fahrenheit, and then use a mixing valve so that the home users or the users don't get burned. Yeah. yeah. And so the incremental cost is that control hardware plus the mixing valve, and that's about it. That's it, yeah. yeah. And then, and like Steffers is a company that's making particular water heaters that do this kind of like without any retrofit. And I, I think of that as like a one-way storage facility. Like you're, you, you, it doesn't solve the problem of under generation, it solves the problem of over generation. Yeah, well, it solves the problem of under generation if you're good at it, which means you, you need to predict when there's going to be an under generation and then that water heater may be running and now it isn't. And it becomes one of those problems that's like, for a single water heater, it's very hard to imagine that working. But when you have 50,000 water heaters, you're like, yeah, we can probably make that work. Like, we can match those two loads as smart people, hopefully. Oh, um, how long can you store the ice for? You said you, you can let it sit there. Is it like months or is it just hours? Yeah, uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, we never want to store it for more than hours because that just means we're not delivering value. Yeah. Uh, refrigeration can be a quite noisy affair, but when I looked at your diagram, it looked like you could separate these uh, systems pretty well. Is that true? I mean, could you um, put the ice maker or uh, the, the vapor compressor part somewhere where it doesn't bother anyone and the main unit somewhere else? Yeah, we, we definitely could. Um, and that's really important in, in, like, a, um, uh, in like a supermarket. Um, it's easier, you know, there's pros and cons. Um, I, I would never say that like running brine secondary loops, which is what we do because we have a brine as our refrigerant. Um, running brine secondary loops is very quiet, very low cost, and very easy. It does come with higher pumping power than running a refrigerant loop. Um, in the grand scheme of things, those are not very important, but there's kind of pros and cons. Um, but in general, we can break apart our system pretty easily because we're just pumping fluids, and so it's very cheap 
to pump them around. Um, in an industrial setting, uh, nobody cares because it's very loud and everyone is driving forklifts and yelling. And yeah. In the case of supermarket refrigeration, you could also offer the fact that you have, for all back, for you have, you have a, a, a backup in case there's power outages, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and and that's actually I don't know if anyone in the audience is familiar with a company called Axiom Exergy. Um, so they put Exergy right in their name, so I don't know how I can get in trouble. Um, but. They, one of the big things that they offer is to supermarkets, they, they have a battery, it's a standalone ice battery, um, but uh, one of the, the ways that they kind of position their product is as a, a backup for power outages, which are extremely expensive for uh, supermarkets. I mean, they can lose $150,000 in a night. Yeah. Martin Hughes of the Project Drawdown which implies taking carbon out of the atmosphere, but about 90% of the 100 ca categories that they have, about 90% are just efficiency, renewable energy. And so there's kind of 10 things that can take carbon out of the atmosphere. Is there any way you can think of using what you're doing to take carbon out of the atmosphere? Gosh. <laughs> um, I let, let me give you an example. Yeah. Mostly, uh, or many people are talking about taking carbon dioxide <clears throat> and liquefying it using an amine solution, for instance, with carbon dioxide at different temperatures that goes in and out. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, there are several carbon sequestration processes that are really thermal. So I think that, you know, there's one that uses. Um, ammonium carbonate and you have like a cycle where you're pulling the carbon in and then um, and to some extent you know those processes are all need cooling or need heating um, I would say that you know it's not obviously based on my answer my main focus um, <laughs> but you know I think we've yeah, and, and just in general, it's like vapor compression is, we've solved the problem of vapor compression's intransigentness by just making it as cheap as we possibly can and oversizing it. And in a lot of situations that works, but really whenever you have a refrigeration cycle, there's usually opportunity to come in and with a cycle that's more flexible, make it either much more efficient because you're not running at part load or making it um, just more economical because you don't have to buy so much equipment. Yeah. Uh, you started to address this when you talked about integrating your system with renewable energies and stuff. Um, I just wondered how much work has the company done um, integrating with you know electrical systems and or providing a interface to the utility so that you can't, can't act as a demand response device, that sort of thing? Yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've spent some time as a company um, on kind of like the high level, uh, microgrid, something like that, much more as a thought experiment and, and for fun. Um, what we have spent a lot of time on is um, all of our systems are cloud connected. There's a you know a secure web UI that the user can uh, access. You can send text message commands to the system. So as far as responding to utility demand signals, we're ready to do that today. Um, but as far as like really pressing the utilities to like get on board and, and help us you know, make an ecosystem around it. Um, we're much more focused on working with the customer to get the systems in the ground um, because that's just wh where we see the, the biggest bottleneck. Once the systems are in the ground, the utility is gonna come and take advantage of them. Um, 
but right now we're just really focused on making product and, and shipping it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So, um, jumping over here and a couple other folks were mentioning Project Drawdown, and I was just double checking <laughs> that to see if I remembered correctly that the number one um, solution in, in Project Drawdown was specifically refrigerant management. So, my understanding was, okay, because of the vast amount of conventional refrigerants that end up getting released into the atmosphere, you know, that, that would have a huge impact if we weren't doing that. So, for example, um, I don't know a huge amount of refrigeration, but I know that, for example, the biggest cause of RV explosions is old gas absorption refrigerators, because the ammonia in those gas absorption refrigerators is highly corrosive to those systems. And so you have an enormous, it's the biggest cause of RV fires and explosions, like thousands of them per year and huge class action lawsuits. And that some cooling systems that I had heard of, I was talking earlier with um, somebody about magnetocaloric units that I had heard of, that now there are some commercially available magnetocaloric units that actually use water as a refrigerant. And I had understood that that was one of the main advantages of magnetocaloric systems is that if they could use water as a refrigerant and achieve um, a 30% less electrical usage than conventional refrigeration <laughs> systems in use, especially for air conditioning systems and for most refrigerants, um, most commercial AC units, that those two things, like specifically not using a GHG emitting refrigerant like R134A or R410A, and then also um, just achieving greater electrical efficiency, but those two things, if they um, come out on a large scale, would be huge. I mean, does that does that apply to your system in the sense of, I mean, would there be efficiencies? I guess what I'm asking is, is there a vulnerability in your system in the long term because you're using ammonia? Would it be um, possible or better to be able to just use? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so to be clear, uh, we don't use ammonia right now in our ice maker, which is the kind of like the thing in our system that has a refrigerant. Uh, we tie into ammonia systems as a retrofit um, at industrial facility. But really what we want to do long term is uh, we want to have our ice maker and then the freeze point suppression cycle and then that directly feeds all the load of the facility. So we want to get rid of the ammonia system also. And what's great about our system is in, in the freeze point suppression cycle, we're using water and organic salt. Um, so there's definitely not any GHG, but it's also you know, super low toxicity, not dangerous to aquatic life, not flammable, et cetera, et cetera. Then we want to move our ice maker towards some natural refrigerant. So whether that's pro a propane, like super low charge propane ice maker, or a new kind of cycle that's good at, you know, those kind of medium temps that an ice maker operates at. Um, that's where, you know, I really would like to get to as a company. Integrating with ammonia systems is the necessary first step to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear a lot about refrigeration, including night sky cool. Mm -hmm. Is there any opportunity here to take Yeah, if of night sky cooling could get down to just like 30F, 28F, and we could just make our ice at night not using any electricity, that would be awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, at these temperatures, you know, we're talking about an incremental saving. So we actually applied for a grant that we didn't end up winning um, with, uh, now I'm totally spacing on, on the name of the company, but the guys at Stanford that are doing, you know, the giant plates for um, space irradiation cooling, where they, you know, are bypassing all the absorption in the atmosphere and so they can access the low, low space air temperature. Um, and so there we were talking about, you know, a cold storage facility that used that to do its condensing so that you didn't have to operate at such a high head pressure. And um, so there's definitely some integration ideas there. Um, and it really comes down to, again, the same thing where it's like we're, you know, heads down, building things, trying to get them in the ground. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the ice maker is, 
it's like we have something that works great. I would really love somebody else to sell me something that works better. Um, yeah. Have you modeled what it would take to take the like the glass freezing example and convert it all to your ice point expression, your freeze point expression instead of you know integrating it with their existing system? Say they were building a new facility. Yeah. And so. Yes. Did you know like what the payback? Because you said it's real good. Um. No. Yeah. So I mean, the, the the key there is if we can find a facility that is just very, very blast center focused, the additional throughput that a full ice point system can generate is huge. You know, it's not 10%. Because we can match that, we can match the maximum amount of heat you can pull out of the product all the way down. And just that, the difference in, you know, there's two ways to look at it. Either we get much more throughput for the same capex, or we get much, uh, much lower capex for the same throughput. Yeah. So when you said forty-one dollars per kilowatt or something, is that once you are able to scale it, or what kind of volume does your yeah need to meet that, those that's prices? a great question. I mean, right now this the pilot system we have it is not at forty-one. Um, I think unit three will be at that. So that's for a retrofit liquid subcooler. Um, yeah, a small, a small system. If we were at a full scale system, I, I, I don't know what the, I mean, I only have capital costs for, you know, a compressor this big, not a 500 horsepower MVR compressor. So yeah, I don't, I, I get uncomfortable uh, when I don't have a quote for a real compressor. Yeah. So I saw an ice maker in Sudan that operated during the day on input solar and at night, night side cooling. And it's sort of like a natural gas refrigerator, I think, in some sense. Yeah. Does, does, does that make sense also here? Could you add that? Yeah, I mean, that's basically what we're doing for low temps. And so we, we've talked about one, one thing we had to do as a company. Um, we didn't think we were going to have to do this, but when we started, we thought we were going to just be able to go out and buy an ice maker and put it on top of a tank and start freeze point suppression cycles. Um, but what ended up happening was commercially available ice makers are very um, inefficient and also expensive. Um, and they produce very high quality ice that's potable or can be released into the environment in mines. And those are the two big applications. Um, our application we didn't really want really nice ice we wanted really cheap and efficient ice so we ended up having to take a year and design an ice maker from scratch um, and that ice maker is very very efficient but it makes um, really unattractive ice um, it, it's actually very oily ice um, and so like most refrigeration systems, we have an oil that circulates through that lubricates everything and allows us to make ice in a very, very cheap, efficient way. Um, we have talked internally about, you know, what could we do with that technology? Um, and so, you know, doing air conditioning loads and just ice banking um, is definitely something, but uh, yeah, I feel like I keep coming back to this. Yeah, we're just heads down making yeah. units. Um, but there's definitely a possibility there. Yeah. So I guess for different products you want ice to make ice cubics, you want to have different ice ingredients to have different melting points <laughs> to get like how fast you can uh, ice the product. Are you considering in the future like change your ingredient that change the ra uh, ratio of different? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Luke, who's our the head of the separation system. Um, and is just a brilliant engineer. Um, he is, is always saying like, we only have two components in the system. Nothing just has two components. Let's add like five more. Like we're gonna have 5% this and 20% that. And um, so I think there's a huge amount of optimization um, that, that could be done there in the future um, to m either make the ice maker better, to make the ice maker freeze at higher temperatures, 
to make the freeze point suppression better, to make the separation easier. Um, and we have a, an unlimited amount of ideas of how to do that, um, but just not a whole lot of time to investigate them all. Anyone else? I'll try one crazy one. Uh, obviously, I'm interested in carbon dioxide removal. And the people doing that are also very concerned about Arctic ice, mm -hmm. which is disappearing rapidly. And there are quite a few people trying to figure out how to add ice in the Earth. Can you help? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I mean, I like to think that I can do a lot of things, but when I hear about people trying to do Arctic ice, it's like, bless your heart. <laughs> That's hard. Yeah, I've, I've, made, I've made a lot of ice um, in the past two years, three years, um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's much harder than you would think. And... Um, the oil companies make ice for roadways. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it takes a lot of, of effort, but yeah, it's an application. I don't think. At least you can reduce the warming aspect by your efficiency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and and that's like when when we as a team talk about why we're doing this. Um, all of us are came to rebound in one way or another because we want to address climate change and we like to build stuff. So that's kind of the overlap. Yeah. How long did it take you to get from you know, the initial conception to prototype in the field? Yeah. Um, is it possible to unlock this computer? Because I want to I want to just show one image. Um, yeah, so we started, uh, I, I started two months, I convinced Kevin to leave, I had worked with him at Abengoa, um, I convinced him to leave after about two months, um, which looking back, I have no idea why he did that, but it's not like I had any data or anything. Um, but then, uh, I would say, so I left in, in January, and then by the summer we knew we, we had an initial model of the freeze point suppression cycle. It was nothing like what we're doing now, but is the same thermodynamics. I built this thing um, in my spare bedroom, um, gosh, the next, the following fall. Uh, before I built this, I built a calorimeter that would tell you, you know, like you mixed some salt and ice together and what temperature did it get to and how much heat did you absorb. This cycle, we'll call it a cycle, um, it could cycle, uh, it could provide like 0.1 watts of cooling, <laughs> like one, one watt peak. Um, and we actually use data from that thing to get NSF funding um, <laughs> to then build this system. Um, and this system, this is just one of the config. We rebuilt this one again and again and again. But this was our um, our NSF Phase One SBIR uh, prototype, um, and it was much more of a cycle. Actually, very a, a legitimate cycle, um, and it could provide ten watts of cooling. So it was like a factor of ten. Then we built this unit, which was actually a much smaller, kind of packaged unit, and we put it in a Whole Foods because they let us, and, um, <laughs> and it could provide a similar amount of cooling. Then we scaled up to this unit. This was our NSF Phase Two unit. After seeing this, the NSF was like, you guys definitely need more money. <laughs> um, and we were able to build this unit. This unit could provide um, up to up to uh, a kilowatt, and we shipped it out to Southern California and had Southern California Edison run it for a while, um, and they they were like, "Wow, this is really cool!" And they wrote a report which you can download online if you like. Um, and then they were like, wh "Where can we put this thing next?" And we were like, "Well, we already got a PO to build this unit, 
So we have no time for that unit. So like that unit is just sitting in storage. Um, and then we built this unit, which is 10 times bigger than that. So it's 10 kilowatts. Um, so basically each of these stages is going up by a factor of 10. And now we're building one more, it's 10 times bigger. Anything else? Yeah, thank you guys.